The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. So, um, quick introduction. I'm uh, Baron Schwartz. I'm the author of High Performance MySQL, and I've written a number of tools for MySQL, including Motkit, which is now the Percona Toolkit. Um, Percona provides support services, software, and engineering for the MySQL database server. We also provide the only open source hot backup utility for MySQL. <coughs> and um, we also create Percona Server, which is a performance and functionality enhanced version of, of MySQL. If you've heard of MariaDB, Percona Server, MariaDB, and Drizzle are the three major variations of MySQL. So um, enough about us. Uh, I'm going to cover sort of a two-part talk today. I'll be explaining how you can use uh, TCP packet headers to get sort of a black box view of performance and scalability characteristics into your system. And then in the second part, I'll be showing you how you can apply a, um, a mathematical model to that to forecast beyond what you can observe, which is kind of the holy grail of, of capacity planning and, and performance analysis is to, to measure within a certain domain and then to forecast how the system might behave beyond that domain. So I like TCP IP headers. Um, TCP IP headers are nice because you can capture them easily and on any platform, and there are lots of ways that you can uh, get them. You can get them, for example, if you have access only to a web server and you want to know how the database server is behaving, you can actually capture the, the packets on the web server itself and minus the, uh, the network delay, you have something similar to what happens on the database server. Um, if you have a, uh, a span port on a network device in the middle, you can capture off of there. So basically, you can get lots and lots of data with very little impact to anything. Um, and there are lots of, of network monitoring systems that take advantage of this. I'm only using the TCP dump tool here. I'm not doing anything fancy. This is just uh, this is all very straightforward vanilla Unix um, commands, and um, everything that I'll show you is, is possible to do with open source. So the TCP IP packet headers are the part that I'm going to be most interested in today. I have written protocol decoders for the full MySQL protocol, so I, I know how to dig deep into the packets and get out even the, the encrypted or the uh, uh, compressed protocol. I know how to get out all the data that's in the stream, but um, I don't need that for what I'm going to be showing you today. And in fact, I don't even care what protocol it is. As long as it's a call and response, a synchronous protocol, uh, all I care is when something got sent to the server and when the response came back. I don't care about the, the payload at all. And in fact, um, sometimes there are security or compliance concerns in play such that uh, you couldn't get access to all of that data, but you can get access to the headers because all they contain is IP addresses and port numbers. So, um, so there's nothing usually very privileged about that data, and if you don't have um, uh, if you don't have access to the machines themselves, you can usually get someone else to give you the data easily. So, in this uh, protocol, like MySQL, with a call and response semantics, where somebody makes a call to the server and, and stops and waits until the response comes back, i.e., no pipelining. Um, or no fire and forget, as uh, MongoDB allows you to do, for example. Uh, you can time the departure of the, uh, of the query from your uh, application server and time the arrival back from the server. And you can say that was the round trip time of the whole, um, of the whole uh, query. Or you can go to the, uh, to the database server and time the arrival there and the departure there and say that was the time of the whole query. Now, this may not be the whole truth. Uh, for example, the time of the first packet back from the server to the, to the client that made a request may not be the time that you want to call the entire execution time of the query. You might want to time from the last inbound packet to the last outbound packet, for example. And so there are some complexities there. But in the general case, um, if you time from the last inbound packet of, uh, uh, to the server and um, uh, 
uh, and then say that the, the query is finished when the first outbound packet comes back the other direction, that t tends to work fairly well. And so um, what we get from TCP IP packet headers is just the IP address and the port, and then TCP dump by observing gives you the timestamps. The timestamps have some, there's some imprecision there. I have never really measured how much, but the uh, timestamps that you'll get printed out from TCP dump have six decimal places of precision. You're not actually getting six decimal places, probably more like four as a guess, because there's some, some variation in uh, when the kernel processes packets and so forth. So you can take those, what I call the fundamental metrics, which is the arrival and the departure and the session identifier, and you can derive more metrics from them. In fact, you can pretty much build everything out of this. So you can uh, chop a time window out of your stream and say, here's the beginning of my observation interval, here's the end, and now we know the elapsed time, and we know how many things happened in that elapsed time, so you get queries per second, which is throughput. Um, throughput as in number of events rather than throughput as in size of events like bandwidth. Uh, we can calculate the busy time or the portion of the uh, time during which the system had at least one request resident and the total execution time of everything within that window just by subtracting arrival and completions. And uh, then we can use some of these fundamental um, laws of queuing systems, such as Little's law and the utilization law, and we can get utilization, average response time, concurrency, and a whole bunch more things. So here's a command line that I typically use to capture these packet headers from a system. And I'll go over exactly what this is about. Uh, the TCP dump dash S384, that's the number of bytes from each packet that I want to capture. So those are the first 384 bytes of each packet. That represents the headers of the TCP packet and the headers of the IP packet, okay? So um, the reason that I'm doing that instead of capturing everything is that on a busy system, if you try and capture too much, the buffers will fill up and you'll start dropping packets. There are ways that you can mitigate that. You can make the buffers larger. Um, you can filter out some of the traffic, for example, but this uh, capturing only the packet headers tends to work quite well. Um, Dash I, any means listen on all of the network interfaces, and this is platform specific to Linux, but on, on most systems, of course, you're going to need to specify an interface that you want to listen on. Dash NNQ uh, um, prevents TCP dump from resolving IP addresses into host names, because what we really care about is IP addresses here, and makes the output a little bit quieter. And then the four dash T's format timestamps with full precision. And this long, complicated expression that I've actually broken over two lines comes out of the TCB dump man page, and it basically says, ignore everything that is, for example, an ACK. Um, ignore all of the things that don't carry protocol level information. Ignore all of these um, sort of um, setting up the, the handshake for setting up a TCP connection. Throw all of that stuff away and only show me um, things that represent a payload at the next level up in, in, the, um, in the seven layer model. And then I'm just printing the result into this file called tcpfile.txt. Now, in reality, in a lot of cases, I will use the dash w argument to TCP dump, which writes the binary file out. Then I'll ship that binary file off somewhere else, and I'll do the rest of all of this complicated you know, timestamp formatting and so forth um, uh, elsewhere rather than, than writing out in um, a textual format. But this, uh, this ends up printing one line per packet into this file. Um, I just mentioned about drop packets. Uh, I didn't mention why it's so important. The way that I am timing queries to the server, as I mentioned, is I'm watching for an inbound packet and an outbound packet that have the same session identifier, IP and port. And I'm correlating the two. If I have dropped packets, I'm gonna miss some observations and I can potentially see, for example, an inbound packet, miss the response, miss the next inbound packet, catch a response, and then conclude that there was a very long running query where none existed. And even with a very small portion of dropped packets, this becomes a pretty serious problem quickly. So you do need to make sure that TCP dump doesn't report that there was um, dropped packets. You know, if there were a few packets dropped, okay, you potentially have missed or mangled a couple of requests. But if you have 1% or something like that, uh, one or 2% in my experience completely skews all of your observations. So you need to be careful about that. I'm sorry, say again? Is 
when you do a ping. Okay, so the question is, when I'm talking about dropped packets, is that different from what I would get if I do a ping? Yeah, it is TCP dump itself. Even if the network is not dropping any packets, TCP dump is hooking into the kernel and asking to observe the stream, but it's, it's giving the kernel a limited buffer to uh, observe within. And if TCP dump gets too busy or a large packet comes in and overflows that, bucker, that buffer, um, the kernel will, um, uh, I don't know whether it's the kernel or whether TCP dump will drop the packet. In, in other words, it'll say there was some data, but I didn't have time to observe it. Okay. It's not a network problem, it's a TCB dump problem, yeah. And so it, um, TCB dump will print out a little bit of information to the standard error. Uh, so if you're redirecting the output to a file, you will still see at the end, if you control C to cancel TCB dump, at the end you will see you know, captured a million packets, dropped, hopefully zero. So there will be a little bit of meta information about the, the information gathering that you did. And you just want to examine that and see that you didn't get um, many dropped packets from TCP dump itself. So this is what the data looks like. Um, each line represents a packet, as I mentioned, and this font kind of somehow came out very, strong, uh, very small here, so I hope you can see it. But on the left-hand side, we have timestamps, um, date, time, and microseconds. Um, as I said, it's not really uh, uh, reliable all the way out to the microsecond level. IP, and then we have an IP address and a port number, so we have 10.124.62.89.56520. So that is the originating packet. I, I gathered this data on a server, on the MySQL server. That's the originating packet. And then we have the less than symbol and the IP address of the MySQL server listening on port 3306. The last little bit here, TCP 142, indicates the number of bytes that were in the payload that we didn't capture because we only captured the, uh, the, the headers. And then the next line after this we can see is from port 3306, the, the MySQL server, back to um, the same IP and port as we saw in the first line. So those, two, uh, those first two lines actually represent a packet in followed by a responding packet out. And you can kind of um, look down through these and see the, the same sort of thing with some of these others. On a busy system, you'll have a packet going in, the packet coming in from a bunch of other servers, and then you'll see a, a, a packet responding to your first one. So we won't necessarily see a, a request followed immediately by the response. There'll be a lot of interleaving. So this is a nice textual format that we can munge with standard Unix command line tools quite well with awk and Perl scripts, and I've, I've written a, a series of, of Perl scripts that are in the Percona toolkit, and I'll be showing you kind of how to, how to use those. So here's a little bit larger version. I should have <laughs> thought to show you that um, in case you were having trouble seeing it. So this uh, Perl tool is called PTTCB model, and that's part of Percona toolkit, free, open source. You can download it from percona.com. And uh, by default, if you give it this file that I'm showing you on the top and then redirect the output into another file that I'll call requests.txt, it finds correlated pairs of packets and puts them into a single line. So what we, what we have at, as a result here is the, uh, the start timestamp. This is .818202. Um, that's the same as we see up there. And the end timestamp, .818440. That's the same as um, the second line there. The elapsed is the difference, so 238 microseconds between those two. And then this host port, which frankly we actually ignore from here on. Um, but you can see how it's taking each pair of lines that are related to each other and producing a single line in the output, which makes it convenient for processing further with yet more Unix command line tools. And we can do lots and lots of interesting stuff with this. I'll start with this output. Um, and I'll show you the first set of functionality that I described, which is what I call black box performance analysis. So all of these plots and analysis that I'm going to show you is made from a single sample of data from a real production server. Um, it's running a Ruby on Rails e-commerce application, and it's pretty heavily trafficked. Um, it's a, a fairly typical sort of online transaction processing system. And uh, you'll see a bunch of anomalies and, and strange things popping out in the data. Um, data is not uniform in most cases. There's also some other stuff that happens on this system. There are cron jobs. There are other background processes. 
Um, there's a, there are special requests that come infrequently that are not like the sort of normal requests that are constantly going in and out of the system. So we'll see kind of some of those things. So my black box performance analysis, the first thing I do is pull up GNU plot. Um, you can use other tools. You could, in theory, use a spreadsheet, but it's actually quite painful to do so. So uh, the tools that I encourage people to learn are GNU plot or R. Both of those are good ways to just take a file that has um, space-separated words, slurp it in, and do interesting things with it very quickly. So GNU plot is my tool of choice here, and I kind of built some tools around it. So I've, I've never really uh, learned R because I learned GNU plot first. And all I'm doing here is uh, um, plotting the response times of this whole sample of data, which I think was uh, 17 seconds or something like that. So time moves from right to left. And then I'm plotting the fourth column, which was that response time, the, the elapsed column, the difference between the inbound and outbound packets. Um, so response time is on the vertical axis. And you can see that most of, these, uh, most of these things are actually clustered very closely down around the x-axis. So the vast majority of, of requests to this server complete in um, a couple of hundred microseconds. But then we have these strange sort of towers or, or spikes of requests that are piling up here. And we also have another, um, an, another pattern that I've indicated with a red line here where we've got sort of some queries that are outliers, and they all look like they're about the same length. So there's a couple of different patterns. I can look at this data real quickly and see that there's something happening in this system that I want to learn more about. And that is really the purpose for me of this black box performance analysis. So in what I think of as kind of the bad old days, if you were to do a performance analysis project on a system, you might allocate four to six weeks for it um, to get all of your access, to get your credentials, to get in there, to you know, maybe even insert new devices into the, into the customer's network or to install um, uh, instrumentation software on their database servers. And it can be a, a very heavyweight process, and you would have a whole you know, long project plan that you would have explained to the client and what the outcomes are. Um, but one of the things that you wouldn't know was, is there anything even worth looking at on these systems? Right? So you would have some sort of an assumption <laughs> that this system uh, is going to produce some fruitful results from a deep performance analysis. Well, I just did this in like 30 seconds, right? <laughs> and, and I can tell you that there is something interesting and frankly, kind of weird and disturbing happening on this system. We have a lot of very uniform requests, and then we have some uniformly slow requests, and we have some non-uniform pileups that are happening in the system. So with basically no investment of time or energy, I found that there is a significant, um, let's say, probable cause to dig deeper into these systems. And it may, you know, it's certainly not going to be a four to six week engagement. It may be four to six hours, or it may be uh, you know, days. But at least we've justified um, looking into things more deeply before we spend a lot of somebody's time and money and do something very intrusive. So these anomalies um, can be explained, particularly this, the spikes here, the, uh, the vertical spikes. If you notice, they're not completely vertical. They're tilted a little bit this way. That's not an optical illusion. They actually are tilted that way. Because I plotted them in uh, completion time order. In other words, the, the uh, progression of time from left to right is actually ordered according to the time that those packets, the responses, came back from the server to the client. And this is just a side effect, a, a happy side effect, of the way that we process the data. Um, my, my tool that transformed the data from TCB dumps format into the next output format that I showed you it prints out a line every time it sees the response. So the response represents the completion of a query, and therefore, by default, those lines are actually um, uh, being printed out in completion time order. And that actually has some very nice properties. Um, lots of sort of little simple things end up having very deep meaning when you, when you dig into things like this. So what's happening here that causes a, a spike like that to slope this way is that something is acquiring some lock, other things are blocking on that. And uh, when the lock is released, uh, let's say that the, the first guy gets the lock here and holds it until here. Meanwhile, this guy blocks on it, and so does this one. Then the first one releases it. The second one is able to actually do its work. This yellow portion represents the, the period of time that it was doing work rather than waiting for a resource to be freed up. And, um, and when it finishes, then this one can do its work. And so what we're really seeing here 
is uh, if you're familiar with the term service time as opposed to response time, service, is, uh, service time is the res response time plus the wait time. The red is the wait time, the yellow is the service time, and a natural consequence of plotting these things in completion order is that we get a slope to the right. And here I've exaggerated it. But uh, we see the same thing in that data. So the stalls in this case are select for update. This particular system, uh, Ruby makes it very easy to do select for update without realizing it, which is a, a mutually exclusive access to the data. Um, there's a dot lock syntax, and what that really does is change the underlying query into select for update without you knowing about it, and you end up with a database full of select for update queries. So um, I, uh, I lied to you a little bit. I didn't capture just 384 bytes on this system. I captured uh, 4,096 bytes, which still allowed me to, to avoid um, any uh, dropped packets, and the customer was fine in this case. The, the data is not proprietary to them. Um, so that gave me more uh, of the packet, and I was able to then decode that and see that these queries were indeed the select for update. So I, I proved my, my theory. And I used uh, the PT Query Digest tool, which is another of the tools in Percona Toolkit, to inspect those queries and decode them. It has a, a MySQL protocol decoder built into it. And uh, those clustered uh, spikes are caused by things waiting for, essentially waiting for the same row lock um, in exclusive mode. So if we saw completion times kind of pulling this pattern out very clearly, maybe we can see some more uh, information about completion times. The next, um, the next stage of charts that I'm going to show you here comes from running the tool against that uh, second output file. And um, there's a, another mode that you can run the tool in where it'll group things into buckets of time. So it'll take that, that whole time series that I showed you and slice it into little intervals. And within each interval, we will count um, and aggregate the statistics in various ways. For example, we'll sum up the response times, we'll do um, standard deviation over those response times, and so forth and so on. The most basic thing that we can do with an interval of time is just count the, the number of, of requests and response that were in it. So here we've got um, the completion counts. Actually, um, I'm, I'm counting the number of completions on the left and the number of, sorry, arrivals on the left and completions on the right. So maybe the difference in arrivals and completions can tell us something. And if you, if you look at these charts, you can see there are apparently some, you know, there are some differences. For example, look up in the outlier region here. This pattern is a little bit different than the corresponding pattern over here. Um, they don't quite match up. And if you plot them on top of each other, you, think, you, you might think that maybe if you plot them on top of each other, you could see a, a real clear pattern. But actually, most of the points just obscure each other, and the remaining points are kind of like, well, what does that mean? I don't know. Um, so it ends up being basically about as revealing as looking at these graphs. <laughs> so this is, this is um, as mentioned on the, on the slide, these are graphed into five millisecond buckets. And you can kind of stare at them and you can say, I don't really see anything there. One of the dangers of plotting things is that uh, we can fool ourselves by thinking there's a pattern in the graph. And all meaning has a pattern, but not all pattern has a meaning. So uh, it's, very, it's very easy to sort of, you know, it's like looking at clouds and seeing puppy dogs and bunnies in the clouds. <laughs> They're just clouds. <laughs> so we have to be careful when we look at things um, that we're not uh, ex sort of uh, projecting meaning into something that isn't there. So this doesn't look like a very fruitful way to go, but maybe if we subtract the arrivals and the completions from each other, we can see a, a pattern. And in indeed, um, that does pull out spikes. Now, um, I, if you look here, the first bullet point says five milliseconds is too fine-grained. If you shorten your observation window far enough, you will see spikes. It's just a fact of how computer systems work because there is some time delay while things are being processed inside the system, and there is always some amount of queuing. The question is just how much queuing is tolerable for your system. If most queries are responding on this system in 200 milliseconds, uh, uh, microseconds, then 200 microseconds is probably not an abnormally long amount of time for something to pile up. Um, five milliseconds might be a second. You know, certainly uh, a, a second is, is not a, um, a query that I like to see when most queries are much, much faster than that. So I chose 200 milliseconds here, and um, that means five buckets per second. 
So we can see that that pulls out two spikes in this data very clearly. Now there's an accompanying white paper for this presentation, for the, for the first part of this presentation on Percona's website. And in that web paper, uh, I explained how I chose, there's, there's a, a heuristic or a rule of thumb for choosing what kind of aggregation interval. So it's not just completely random. Um, uh, but my point is that if you make the, uh, the aggregation interval too small, you will get all spikes. So basically, if you look very closely into any system, you're going to see that it has some bursty behavior. And that's just the way that computer systems work, because they are networks of devices with queues in between them. So here I've uh, taken those 200 millisecond um, buckets, and I've drawn it as a, ch as a chart of arrivals and completions on the left and the right. And then I've shown you the subtraction between them on the right to, to make it clear how, um, how this helps you pull the, the pattern out, and how it helps you pull the signal out of all of that noise. Right? So the characteristic pattern that, that comes out of here is you see a, a dip where things are stuck in the system in process, and then you see a spike where they're completing after whatever that resource is is released, um, and they're all completing in a rush, and you get that, that very characteristic down and then up pattern if you subtract the two from each other. There's a few other things that we can do. I mentioned that we compute, for example, um, uh, standard deviation of response times, those kinds of things. We can also compute percentiles. Uh, but one of the more interesting things for purposes of this black box analysis is to look at some measure of how variable the response times are in each little window of time. And variability generally means optimizability, because um, things that are running uh, with highly variable performance are things that are not running like each other. And what we'd like to do is make things very, very consistent. If some things are running fast, then why can't they all run fast? So uh, what I like to do is try and make everything run fast. Uh, so we get consistent and, and stable and predictable performance. And this uh, metric called the variance to mean ratio helps us to do that. Standard deviation is also a measure of the variability, but the problem is that its units have the same uh, magnitude as the units of the input data. So it becomes difficult to compare systems. For example, it becomes difficult to, to compare a system like this where we have 200 microsecond queries versus a system that has 200 millisecond queries. It's hard to say which one is more variable than the other or which one is better or worse than the other. But if we normalize those things relative to the average response time in the system, then it becomes very easy to see. Um, and that's what the variance to mean ratio gives us, is a, a normalized measure of the dispersion of those response times. So here's the same sample of data. Again, time moving from left to right in 200 millisecond buckets. And you can see some, some spikes there, spikes up to uh, uh, an index of dispersion ratio of about three. Um, and I'll show you in a, in a moment all of these charts together so you can kind of see the, the various patterns and how they correlate with each other. So I'm not sure from looking at this graph exactly what's happening in here, but I can tell you that something is happening that I want to look into, right? Something. I, I want to know why those, why those regions of time are, are more variable. And if I captured more of the protocol, as I did in this particular example, then I can actually dig in and see which queries were those, right? So I just mentioned this. I like consistency and performance. Um, so here's all three of these plots together. And you can see that the spikes are, uh, of, of long, you know, these, these locking spikes are, are uh, exactly where the subtraction of uh, arrivals versus completion spikes are. So it's basically two ways of seeing the same thing. I actually prefer this uh, second graph down on the bottom here over the, uh, the, the points clustered, because you can, you can get very sensitive with that. And I've actually found um, some problems in systems where uh, we didn't have such a uniform distribution of response times. Um, this uh, this this system is very clean. You know, the, the workload is not very mixed. There's some mixture of, of workload there. But in general, we've got only a few different types of queries running. And when you get a system that has more diversity of query types running, that, that graph won't look just like a blue line with some dots. It'll look more like you know, somebody kind of sprayed it with a spray, a spray can of paint. And even in cases like that, I found that the spike analysis can pull out the fact that there are bad things happening in there. And this index of dispersion spikes on the right um, 
it seems to be showing a different problem, which I did not yet dig into. Um, so I, I can't really tell you what that problem was. But um, some, of the, some of the variability in response time um, lines up with, it, it's, it's hard to get all three of these things lined up together and not make them too small to see. But I can sell, tell you that some of these things line up with these very obvious spikes on the first graph, um, and some of them don't. So there are, there are other things happening in there. So this is kind of academic because I, I took a system that I knew had some problems and, and I said, let me prove that there are problems. Let me prove that we can visualize the problems easily with very little work. Uh, but this has been done by other people as well. <laughs> and um, uh, One of my clients, Aaron Brown, did this with uh, his TCP traffic for, for his web cluster. And um, this was outside of the database arena. This was only on uh, the TCP um, and HTTP level. And um, he just applied the same techniques. And actually, what he was doing was looking for ammo to take to his network operating. The, uh, the, the folks that were operating the data center claimed that there were no problems with the networking. He used this as proof that there were problems with the networking. This is aggregated in one second intervals. And you can see there are times when traffic basically completely stops for one or two seconds, and it's not infrequent, right? So um, it's actually happening all the time, little short, complete outages in the network, and you, you pretty much can't argue with this data. So interestingly, what happened here, I, I'm going to beat up on SANS for a little bit. It's one of my favorite things to beat up on. Uh, what was happening here was that um, they were taking SANS snapshots for backups. This is a, a cloud provider. I, I won't mention it to protect the innocent um, exactly which cr cloud provider it was, but they're taking SAN snapshots. And the impact of the SAN snapshot was actually um, uh, flowing through to the operating system of the system that was running their switches <laughs> and their load balancers. And so it was actually freezing them briefly and causing some blocking that was cascading up through these layers. So we think of SAN snapshots as being instantaneous and very fast, but you know, they're not completely instantaneous. They're long enough to cause some blocking that can impact your, your load balancer, of all things. So thus concludes part one. And in part two, I'm going to start uh, extrapolating this out a little bit further into some mathematical models. So the first thing I'm going to do is talk about scalability, which is one of those things like performance or um, uh, you know, words like that where people talk about it casually, but they don't have a real clear understanding of uh, what exactly we're discussing. And I do uh, find it useful to have a clear understanding that we can all agree on about what specifically we're talking about here. Now, we may have different definitions of scalability, and I'm not saying that those are invalid. I'm just saying that we need something clear when we're, when we're talking about something very specific like this um, so that we can get concrete results. So scalability is an equation, a function. And my understanding of this is not something that I developed on my own. It, it really came from a man named uh, Neil Gunther, who's a giant in uh, performance research and has written a number of good books. I referenced some of them in my resources section at the end. He said scalability is a function. He wrote it in his book. I read it for a year and a half. I never got that he was talking about an equation, <laughs> even though the equation was there. I never really thought about scalability as an equation. So this was kind of a lights on aha moment for me where the x-axis is the number of worker units and the, the y-axis is the throughput. So I'll, I'll show you this in pictures. So throughput on the x-axis, um, um, on the y-axis here, that's how much work is getting done, and this is how much work we're trying to get done, either by adding more resources to a system or by adding more hardware, you know, firing up more threads, whatever it is. So the scalability function is what happens when you plot a number of these points together. So linear scalability is when all of the points are in a perfectly straight line and they intersect the origin. And that's actually really important. One of my favorite things to do is to go to a trade show and walk by the booth of some product and they say linear scalability on their big sign and they've got a PowerPoint slideshow typically on a little kiosk. And the PowerPoint slideshow at some point will flip through a slide that shows things in a straight line. And if you ask them to pause there and do a little math on the numbers, you will very often find that it's not truly a straight line, and it actually doesn't intersect the x-axis at zero. So this is um, linear scalability. To, to be truly linear actually has to go right through that origin, and it has to be a completely straight line. Okay? This is also linear scalability, 
just with a different uh, performance characteristic. So scalability and performance are somewhat orthogonal, although they are related. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about this a little bit generically. Dr. Gunther's book talks about it more specifically in terms of software scalability and hardware scalability. My, um, my axis labeled worker units here, he has two variations of his uh, scalability discussion where he will name those uh, threads or uh, processors, for example, um, depending on whether he's talking about software or hardware scalability. I'm, I'm sort of simplifying a little bit for purposes of illustration. So these are both linear scalability. This is not linear. Any two points form a straight line, but it doesn't intersect the, uh, doesn't intersect the origin. Something is happening here that's costing a little bit, and we're getting a little less than twice as much performance at, at two worker units than we were at one. So this is a typical system, right? Most systems look like this. Um, and people will say 98% linear. Well, if you plot point 0.1 and then you plot 98% of 2 and then you plot 98% of 4 and you keep doing that, you will find that it's not 98% linear. It's actually a nice curve, right? So there's nothing linear about it. There's, there's either linear or not. Um, so what's interesting here is not whether it's linear, but why it's not linear. And this is where I think Dr. Gunther's contribution really is um, in this area. Uh, he explains that there's a few different things that cause uh, systems to scale worse than linearly. So the first thing is what we call serialization. There is a point where all of the work has to be done in a single thread. Okay? So I've got some processes that are working along here. Let's say I've got four parallel processes, and they're doing their work, and then they come to a point where, let's say, the work has to be put together. This might be, for example, the final phase of a MapReduce when all of the results are put together. And um, that represents a point where parallelism is impossible, okay? And after that, we can do, you know, we can uh, work in four parallel processes again. So if we've got four servers or four threads or four CPU cores or what have you, in most systems, there are going to be points in a system's execution where there's at least some degree of seriality. And this is called Amdahl's law, or it's, it's uh, uh, closely related to Amdahl's law. If you model what happens to a system here, um, the, the intuitive way to think about this is that no matter how many worker processes we make here, we can make a billion, we can make infinity worker processes here. And as we make more and more parallel processes, these get shorter, right? Because we're doing a divide and conquer approach. This does not get shorter. And so the shortest that you can make this, this process run in is this amount of time right here. So there's an asymptote. As you um, add more and more parallelism to this system, it asymptotically approaches a ceiling. And the ceiling is the reciprocal of whatever portion that little yellow vertical bar takes. So if 20% if of your system requires some serialization, then you are never going to get faster than uh, an effective speed up of five. No matter how short you make those bars on the left and the right, you can't get any, uh, you can't get this system to run in any faster than that. And the, the mathematical equation for that is that the capacity of n workers is equal to n over one plus sigma, and this is the portion that has to be serialized. So sigma would be 0.2 in the case where 20% um, is our serial for fraction. So, so this is the first factor of why things behave less than linearly. The second factor is what I call crosstalk. It's also called contention or coherency delay, and there's various words for that. Um, and this is when those parallel processes have to do some synchronization between themselves. Um, and this may be at the hardware level, for example, waiting on a cache line to become valid, or maybe some shared lock or something like that. But whatever it is, um, the important insight into this is that the number of potential channels of crosstalk there grows quadratically with the number of parallel processes. And that's expressed here in this box that I've put a red, uh, the, the red box around this new coefficient in the equation on the bottom. If you look at that kappa n times n minus one, n times n minus one as it goes out to infinity is really order n squared. So that's where the, uh, the quadratically increasing cost comes from. And kappa is this, the uh, uh, fraction of this workload that requires crosstalk to, uh, to get its work done. So this is kind of a simplified diagram of what many real systems might look like. 
usually much more complicated than this, but you can usually um, model them as either a single system with some seriality and crosstalk, or a network of interconnected systems with seriality and crosstalk. If you plot these three functions, um, with no crosstalk and no seriality, we get a nice linear scalability curve. With some seriality, we get approaching an asymptote, right? The slope of that red line always remains positive, but it becomes almost flat after uh, some period of time. And then the universal scalability law is with that uh, next fraction added in, and that's the blue line. And this behaves like real systems. It actually has a peak, and then you get worse performance after that. And if you've looked at a lot of benchmarks, you know that this is very typical. If you try and push things further than the uh, limit of their capacity, you'll actually get less work done by trying to do more work. Um, so most systems really behave like the blue line in some way. And it's a useful model. It's not a, a perfect model, but it's a useful model for understanding system performance. So our scalability modeling algorithm, to bring this back to the real world, is uh, we can actually measure the uh, throughput and concurrency, which are the, the axes of that plot. And then we can perform a regression like you can do in your spreadsheet. Um, I use more sophisticated tools than a spreadsheet because spreadsheets typically have a real hard time with a complicated function like that. And you can pull out the sigma and kappa coefficients and then you can do something, hopefully, and profit. Um, but hopefully what comes out the other end is useful to you. So the inputs that we need are throughput and concurrency. The throughput is the part that we've already talked about, right? You just count how many times things happen within a, a given window of time. The concurrency is a little harder. Uh, there's a few different ways that we can get at this data. Um, for my purposes, I've actually built into the PTTCB model tool a, um, an, a, a little algorithm that requires the data to be uh, sorted on the way in by arrival time. And then we uh, simply work through that stream of data, and every time something arrives, we increment concurrency. Every time it departs, we keep track of the time stamping. We decrement the concurrency. And I'll show you a diagram that, that explains this. Time is traveling from left to right here, and if our observation window begins at time zero, and some query arrives here, this uh, Q1 arrives here, and then runs until time four, and then stops, um, in the meantime, Q2 arrives, and briefly here, we have a concurrency of two. Afterwards, we have a concurrency of one again, and then Q2 finishes at times uh, t equals seven. So our observation time is seven units long, and we've got a total query time is the sum of the area under this curve, which is eight units. Therefore, the average concurrency in this time window is eight over seven, or slightly more than one. So this is basically what the TCP, T, uh, PT TCP model tool does uh, to, to compute average concurrency over windows of time. So now we've got the second metric that we need for this universal scalability law modeling, and we can apply, um, the, uh, the, apply that model to our, uh, to our data. So here's just a, uh, I'm, I'm just illustrating the commands that you need to, to get this data out of our previous data. First, I'm sorting the requests file into a sorted file, and then I'm uh, running the PTTCP model tool against that with the type equals requests, and putting that out into what I'm calling sliced.txt. So now I can operate directly off of sliced.txt. So I'm, I'm going to use um, GNU plot, and here I'm, uh, I've actually selected a subset of the, of the points that come out at, at lower concurrency. So I'm trying to use lower concurrencies to forecast what might happen at higher concurrency, which is a very typical request. You know, this is June. Um, we expect that in December our, you know, our Christmas gift online store is going to get a lot of requests, and we'd like to know what's going to happen if the concurrency goes from 4 up to you know, 12, something like that. Well, this model says the picture is not very good looking. Right? Um, the green points are the actual observations. The red line is the model with a sigma of 14% and kappa of less than a percent. Um, there, it looks like there's a very close fit here, 98%. That's the standard R squared um, closeness of fit metric. And visually, you can see well, there's some fit. I mean, it's not as clean as it could be, and I've seen systems that are cleaner than this. Um, but it looks like it might be you know, some sort of useful, useful projection. And we can see that if we're looking out at, at concurrency 12, for example, uh, we're not going to scale. 
we're at that point, we're probably in the, we're past the leveling off and we're probably into the, you're having serious performance problems level. If I plot the rest of the points in there, you see it's actually even worse than that. So the model, the uh, universal scalability law has actually overestimated the scalability of this system. Another interesting thing about this is that these points are kind of more widely dispersed, and that's pretty typical. Um, if you take any data set like this, you will not only see that characteristic curve, but you'll also see it sort of start to shotgun out more as it comes up and, and to the right. So this can give you another indication of uh, how well your system is behaving when it starts to become much less uniform and you start to get um, a, a less tightly clustered set of points there on the plot. This is, uh, this is running in the Amazon cloud. It's on the largest Amazon EC2 instance, which has eight virtual CPUs. As a matter of practical experience, I can tell you that on a system like this, you're not going to run more than eight queries because you've only got eight CPUs, right? So, um, so you can also apply your knowledge of systems and how they behave, and, and you really need to do that. You need judgment in order to interpret these graphs. So I can tell you, uh, on pretty much any system, I can tell you that a working concurrency on an, on an Amazon EC2 system is, uh, on a CPU-bound system is less than eight. On a system that has some mixture of CPU and I.O. bound, you may get 12, maybe, if you're lucky, because some things actually are off CPU while they're waiting for I.O., um, thus effectively freeing up m more CPUs. But you're not going to get a concurrency of 20. It just it doesn't happen. Um, performance tanks very quickly. So how to approach the universal scalability law, in my opinion, is to, to look at it in, in two dimensions. One is best case and one is the worst case. Okay. So the worst case bounds are um, to say that if, if we get deep into the math, there's something called repairman queuing, which is what Amdahl's law models, and then there's something which is even worse, which is called synchronous repairman queuing, and that's what the universal scalability law models. And this is actually, if, if you understand what the, uh, the queuing model is, I should make some diagrams for this. Um, it's a very stupid sort of queuing. It's like nobody would really build a system that behaves this badly, or at least not intentionally, right? So it's a very much of a worst case scalability model. The thinking that I'm applying here is if you are a performance engineer, for example, if you are performance engineering at Percona where we're trying to make MySQL work better, we can use this as a reference point and say, we really le would like the system to perform better than the worst case possibility, right? So we can, we can use this model and we can say, you know, performance and scalability are dropping off more quickly than they should. What's happening? We're maybe entering some range of uh, performance characteristics where we're hitting a new bottleneck that we weren't hitting at a lower concurrency, for example. And we can say there's something that's happening at this higher concurrency, and maybe we can investigate and, and reduce that bottleneck. Um, so systems ought to scale better than the USL, right? And if they don't, we've got something to talk about. If you don't have a model, you don't really have anything to talk about. I mean, if you didn't have a model, who's to say that the, that the graph shouldn't go like that or that the graph shouldn't go like that? It would just be somebody's opinion. On the other hand, if you are a responsible operations engineer, you know that you should never count your chicks before they hatch, and so you're going to use the universal scalability law as a best case model. You're gonna say, that's the ceiling, you know. It may be a worst case, but I'm not gonna count on any more than that. In fact, I probably ought to count on less than that. Um, and that's why we saw uh, back here, we see we really would have been wise to count on less than that red line, right? So be pessimistic if you're using this for capacity planning or for per performance forecasting purposes. Um, it's just a model. We can flip the model upside down, so to speak, and um, throughput, concurrency, and response time have a, a clear mathematical relationship called Little's Law. This is a really interesting uh, fundamental relationship in, in uh, performance mathematics or in, even in operations research, is, which is where it came from, because it makes no assumptions about a lot of things that you otherwise have to put into your models. So many models are very difficult to, to work with because they require a lot of knowledge about the system and about the characteristics of the system. For example, maybe you're familiar with classical queuing theory and the Erlang C functions and so forth. It's beautiful, elegant, correct, works in call centers, very rarely works in uh, database servers because 
you have to have and, and know and measure and prove that you have a certain distribution of response times and a certain distribution of inter-arrival times. And based on those uh, uh, statistical distributions, you might have to apply the Erlang B or the Erlang C or one of the, I think there's like 17 other Erlang models. And they're all very difficult. It's not even a closed form equation. So it's, it's, um, uh, it requires a lot of computation and it's not easy at all to do regressions against it. And so essentially, um, it's a very difficult model to actually apply in the real world. The beauty of the universal scalability law is that it's extremely practical and easy to apply and gives you some sort of a, a yardstick even though it's not um, uh, perfection. And Little's law has similar characteristics. Uh, it's independent of response time, arrival distributions, all of those kinds of things. It works. Um, and the proof of that is actually very complicated for such a simple little law. Uh, and took many years for somebody to actually prove it. But uh, this, it's a, a, a simple relationship between concurrency throughput and response time. So we can take those metrics that we had before, just manipulate the equation a little bit, and we get response time is equal to concurrency over throughput. And you can apply the same uh, model to it. This is actually the same, uh, the same data here. I'm, I'm just plotting it as response time instead of as throughput versus concurrency. So uh, we've still got concurrency along the x-axis here, but the y-axis is response time. And we can use this to forecast, for example, again, pessimistically or, or optimistically, we can use this to forecast um, how long responses might start to take at a particular level of concurrency. So uh, for me, uh, that's why I call this performance forecasting, uh, because for me, performance and scalability are sort of flip sides of the same coin. But it, it doesn't do to, uh, to, to confuse them if you have such precise definitions that you're trying to work with. Um, one of the things that I've had bad luck with a lot is getting dirty data. The universal scalability law works much better when you have nice, clean data on a well-behaved system, or at least a reasonably well-behaved system with not too much mixture in the workload, uh, without too much TCP dump dropping packets, all of those kinds of things. Um, so you do have to actually be careful with the data that you put into it. Of course, garbage in, garbage out. One of the things that I'll do is I'll do that, uh, that uh, black box plot, and I'll look for areas that have bad performance, like those spikes, and I'll say, the system is behaving suboptimally there, and um, I'm going to snip out those sections, right? I'll just throw away that little bit of, of, uh, of the log and not try and analyze over a system that is actually clearly behaving badly at particular points in time. You have to be careful with this. Some people say you should clean your data. Other people say that's just lying. Um, I, I, for me, the balance is somewhere in between. You have to, uh, for me to get good results with these kinds of things, you have to assume that the system is well behaved. If there are points in the system where it's not well behaved, you can say, well, we can do something about that, right? Maybe we can make it behave better. If not, then we, we have to have an entirely different discussion. But if we can capture a period of time um, over a range of different workloads, um, a range of different concurrencies, where the system appears to be reasonably well behaved, then it's OK to look at that as a representative sample. And what you're really trying to do is not model the time during which your backups were running or the time during which your, your hourly rebuild of your summary tables in the database was running or something like that, right? You're trying to find a fairly clear signal without some other noise intruding that, that would throw a monkey wrench into your, um, into your computations. So that's kind of like the standard caveat emptor. The temptation, and I will certainly admit to this, is to kind of see the elegance and the beauty of the universal scalability law and then start trying to do it everywhere. <laughs> and after a half a dozen of those, you kind of start to figure out it doesn't apply everywhere. You have to get good data. You have to understand how to apply it, so forth and so on. So here's some resources. Um, all of the software that I mentioned, other than TCP dump, can be downloaded from percona.com slash software. It's all inside a Percona toolkit. Um, you're in a MySQL talk, so you ought to know about Percona toolkit already. And Neil Gunther's book, Guerrilla Capacity Planning, it's a very dense book. Um, there is a lot of really deep stuff in there. And there's a lot of sort of, he'll show you something, and then he'll say, and then you can do this with it. And you go, great, I'm all enthused and energized. And you go and you start to actually try and apply it to your systems. And you go, I'm lost. I need somebody to help me figure this out. Well, 
Neil Gunther has um, guerrilla capacity planning workshops where you can go, and um, I have heard, but I've not been to one, that those are really hardcore and a very good investment of your time. Or you can look at um, my second white paper here, Forecasting MySQL Scalability, um, with the Universal Scalability Law is the rest of the title on that one. Those white papers are on Percona.com, and uh, all that's free, so uh, you can download all of that. The particular thing about that white paper that I want to encourage you to, to look at it for is that it's, there's a section of it that deals with MySQL, and there's a section that deals with the universal scalability law. So if you get Neil Gunther's book, read his book first, and then read that white paper, and hopefully the section in that white paper on the scalability law can kind of tie things together for you and see, uh, help you see how to apply that in the real world. Because for me, it actually took about a year before I was able to get some traction on this. So hopefully that, that can help you shortcut that. The MySQL performance analysis white paper contains not only the exact data that I've shown you here for the first portion of my slideshow, um, but all of the command line arguments and everything that you need to reproduce my results and get the graphs just like I did. And there's a link to the sample data itself so that you can download a, a tarball of that. And then these slides um, are at this Google URL if you, if you would like those. And I'm also going to give these slides to the Southeast Linux Fest organizers uh, so they can post them. And this is my contact information. I also have business cards. I'm always delighted to talk with people um, in person or on email. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. You can look me up on LinkedIn, connect to me. I'm always happy to talk with people, and I always enjoy the, the discussions that come out of it. I learn a lot from people who've come to this talk, and then afterwards they point me in new directions, um, most of which I have yet to follow up on. <laughs> Time is a precious resource. Uh, we have a few minutes, I think, for questions. Or, yes, sir? In SNMP? Yeah, so th one of the things I didn't mention, um, but one of the real uh, motivators for this is that a lot of systems are either not instrumented or very poorly instrumented. So even in a system that's completely uninstrumented, like let's say Memcached, Memcached has a few counters, right? They really don't tell you anything about what's going on inside the system. TCP is a great way to, uh, to get that information without having to rely on, that's why I call it black box, because you can kind of ex instrument systems externally. Um, so if you get the in information directly from the application, for example, Oracle gives you a lot of information um, in the uh, AWR and ASH repositories. You can get all the information directly from Oracle. You don't need to do TCP dump on Oracle, right? MySQL doesn't really have that in, in uh, current version. MySQL doesn't, itself doesn't have any SNMP support, no. Um, in future versions of MySQL, MySQL 5.6 in particular, the performance schema is going to contain a lot of the data that we would need to do this. Um, but what if you're working on MongoDB, or if, what if you want to know the behavior of your whole web cluster of, of uh, uh, Apache servers or something like that? You can still use these techniques. Any more questions? All right, thanks. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to 
the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, this um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the Cloud Stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. 
Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.